Number one was having a lovely dream. In the dream, his mother was holding a surprise party for him in honor of his graduation from Warlock College. The fruit was scrumptious. The dishes were cooked and most of the meat was already dead. He was reaching for a beautifully presented basted pheasant in the basket of wo woven herb red robes, just like the one described in chapter three of Lady Harrington Smith's Hedgerow when suddenly the vision retreated into a far distance as the reality itself were being stretched. Number one tried to follow the feast, but it drew further and further away, and now his legs wouldn't work, and number one couldn't understand why. He looked down and saw to his horror that everything from his armpits down had turned to stone. The stone virus was spreading upward across his chest and along his neck. Number one felt the urge to scream, and he was suddenly terrified that his mouth would turn to stone before he could. To be petrified forever and hold that scream inside would be the ultimate horror. Number one opened his mouth and screamed. Billy Kong, who had been lounging on a chair, watching, snapped his fingers at the camera on the ceiling. The ugly one's awake, he said, and I think it wants its mother. Number one stopped screaming when his breath ran out. It was a bit of an anticlimax, really, starting out with a lusty howl and petering off to a reedy whine. Okay, thought number one. I am alive and in the land of men. Time to open my eyes and find out just how deep in the deep de pig dung I really am. Number one cracked his eyes open warily, as though he might see something big and hard heading for his face at high speed. What he did see was that he was in a small bare room. There were rectangular lights on the ceiling that threw out the light of a thousand candles, and most of one wall was taken up by a mirror. There was a human, possibly a child, perhaps a female, with a ridiculous mane of blonde curls and an extra finger on each hand. The creature was wearing a ludicrously impractical toga-type arrangement and spongy soled shoes with lightning bolts embossed on the sides. There was another person in the room, a slouching, leery, thin man, who tapped a staccato rhythm on his leg. Number one's eyes were drawn to the second human's hair. There were at least half a dozen colors in there. The man was a peacock! Number one decided that perhaps he should raise his empty hands to show that he wasn't carrying a weapon, but it's difficult to do that when you are tied to a chair. I'm tied to a chair, he said apologetically, as though it were his fault. Unfortunately, he said this in Gnomish and in the demon dialect. To the humans, it sounded like he was trying to dislodge a particularly annoying blockage from his throat. Number one resolved not to talk again. Doubtless he would say the wrong thing and the humans would have to ritually execute him. Thankfully, the female seemed eager to chat. Hello, I am Minerva Paradiso, and this man is Mr. Kong. Can you understand me? It was all gibberish to number one, not a single recognizable word from the text of Lady Harrington Smith's hedgerow. He smiled encouragingly to show he appreciated the effort. Do you speak French? Asked the blonde girl, then switched languages. How about English? Number one sat up. That last bit was familiar. Strange inflection, sure, but the words themselves were from the book. English, he repeated. This was the language of Lady Harrington Smith, learned at her mother's knee, explored in the lecture halls of Oxford, used to profess her undying love for Professor Rupert Smith. Number one loved the book. He sometimes believed that he was the only one who did. Even Abbott didn't seem to appreciate the romantic bits. Yes, English. The last one spoke it well enough. French, too. Manners must be appreciated somewhere outside a book, number one had always thought, so he decided to give them a go. He growled, which was a polite demon way of asking to speak in front of your betters. This must not be how humans interpreted it, because the skinny man jumped to his feet pulling out a knife. And no, kind sir, said number one hurriedly, cobbling together a couple of sentences from Lady Harrington. Pretty shy thing weapon, I bring joyous tidings only. The skinny human was confounded. He spoke English as well as the next American, but this little runt was spouting some kind of medieval nonsense. Kong straddled number one, holding the knife to his throat. Talk straight, ugly, this said the man, deciding to give Taiwanese a go. I wish I could understand, said number one, shaking. Unfortunately, he said this in Gnomish. What I meanest to say is... It was no good. Quotes from Lady Harrington had he could generally shoehorn into any occasion, just weren't coming under pressure. Talk straight or die! Shrieked the human into his face. Number one shrieked right back at him. How can I talk straight, you son of a three-legged dog? I don't speak Taiwanese! All of this was said in perfect Taiwanese. Number one was stunned. The gift of tongues was not one demon's possessed. 
except the warlocks. More proof. He intended to ponder this development for a few moments, now that the knife-wielding human had backed off. But suddenly, the beauty of language exploded inside his brain. Even his own tongue, Gnomish, had been severely culled by the demons. There were thousands of words that had been dropped from regular use, on the basis that they did not relate to killing things or eating them, and not necessarily in that order. Cappuccino! shouted number one, surprising everyone. Excuse me? asked Minerva. What a lovely word! And maneuver! And balloon! The skinny man pocketed his knife. Now that he's talking, if he's anything like the videos you showed me of the other one, he'll never get them to shut up! Pink! exclaimed number one delightedly. We don't have a word for that color in the demon common speak. Pink is considered undemon-like, so we ignore it. Oh, it's such a relief to be able to say pink! Pink, fabulous, said Minerva. Oh, tell me, what is cotton candy? I know the words and it sounds scrumptious, but the picture in my head cannot be accurate. The girl seemed pleased that number one could talk, but slightly miffed that he had forgotten his situation. We can talk about cotton candy later, little demon. There are more important things for us to discuss. Yes, agreed Kong. The demon invasion, for example. Number one rolled the sentence around in his head. Sorry, my guess might not be fully developed. The only meaning I have for invasion is a hostile entry of an armed force of a territory. That's the one I mean, you little toad. Again, I'm a little confused. My new vocabulary is telling me that a toad is a frog-like creature. Number one's face fell. Oh, I see. You're insulting me. Kong scowled at Minerva. I think I preferred him when he spoke like an old movie. I was quoting scripture explained number one, enjoying the shape of these new words in his mouth. From the sacred book, Lady Harrington Smith's Hedgerow. Minerva frowned, looking at the scene as she thought back in time. Lady Harrington Smith? Why is that familiar? Lady Harrington Smith's Hedgerow is the source of all our human knowledge. Uh, Lord Abbott brought it back to us. Number one bit his lip, shutting off his own babbling. He had said too much already. These humans were the enemy, and he had given them the blueprint to Abbott's plans. Blueprint. Nice word. Minerva clapped her hands once sharply. She had found the memory she was looking for. Lady Harrington Smith. My goodness, that ridiculous romance. Remember, Mr. Kong? Kong shrugged. I don't read fiction. Manuals, mostly. No, remember that video footage of the other demon? We let him have a book. He carried around like a security blanket. Oh yeah, I remember that. Stupid little goat. Always toting around that stupid book. You know you're repeating yourself, said number one, chattering nervously. There are other words for stupid. Dim, dan, slow, thick, just to name a few. I could do Taiwanese if you prefer. A knife appeared in Kong's hand as if from nowhere. Wow, said number one. That's a real talent. A bravura, in fact. And Kong ignored the compliment, flipping the knife so he was holding the blade. Just shut up, creature, or this goes between your eyes. I don't care how valuable you are to Miss Paradiso. To me, you and your kind are simply something to be wiped off the face of the earth. Minerva folded her arms. I will thank you, Mr. Kong, for not to threaten our guest. You work for my father, and you will do what my father tells you to do. And I'm pretty sure my father told you to keep a civil tongue in your head. Minerva Paradiso may have been a precocious talent in many areas, but because of her age, she had limited experience. From her studies, she, all, she knew how to read body language, but she did not know that a skilled martial artist can train himself to control his body so that his real feelings are hidden. A true disciple of the discipline would have noted the subtle tightening of the tendons on Billy Kong's neck. This was a man holding himself in check. Not yet, his stance said. Not yet. Minerva returned her attention to number one. Lady Hetherington's meets Hedro, you say? Number one nodded. He was afraid to speak in case his runaway mouth leaked any more information than it already had. Minerva spoke now to the large mirror. You do remember that one, Papa? The most ridiculous fluffy moments you were ever likely to avoid like the plague. I loved it when I was a six. It's all about 19th century England aristocrat. Oh, who's the author? Uh, Carter Cooper Barrison, the Canadian girl. She was 18 when she wrote it, did absolutely no research. She had 19th century nobles speaking like they're from the 1500s. Absolute trash, so obviously a worldwide hit. Well, it seems our old friend Abbott brought it home with him. The cheeky devil had managed to sell it as gospel truth. 
It seems he has the rest of the demons spouting Cooper Barbison as though she were an evangelist. Number one broke his no speaking vow. Abbott? Abbott was here? My wee, said Minerva, resting her palms on her knees. How do you think we knew where to find you? Abbott told us everything. A voice boomed through the wall mounted speaker. Not everything. Your, his features were flawed, but my young dean was Minerva figured it out. I'll get you a pony for this, darling, whatever color you like. Minerva waved at the mirror. Thank you, Papa. You should know by now that I don't like ponies. Or ballet. The speaker laughed. <laughs> oh, that's my little girl. What about a trip to Disneyland Paris? You could dress like a princess. Perhaps after the selection committee, said Minerva with a smile. The smile was slightly forced, though. She did not have time for Disney dreams at the moment. After I am sure of the Nobel nomination, we have less than a week to question our subjects and organize secure travel to the Royal Academy in Stockholm. Number one had another important question. And Lady Heddington Smith's Hedro? It's not true? Minerva laughed delightedly. <laughs> true? Oh, my dear little fellow, nothing could be further from the truth. That book is a cringeworthy testament to teenage hormonal fabrication. Number one was stunned. But I studied that book for hours. I acted out scenes. I made costumes. Are you telling me that there is no Hethington Hall? No Hethington Hall. And no evil Prince Carlos? Fiction. Number one remembered something. But Abbott came back with a crossbow just like in the book. That's evidence. Kong joined the discussion. After all, this was his area of expertise. <laughs> Crossbows. Ancient history, Toad. We use things like these now. Billy Kong drew a black ceramic handgun from a holster tucked in his armpit. This little beauty shoots fire and death. We've got much bigger ones, too. We fly around the world in our metal birds and rain down exploding eggs on our enemies. Number one snorted. <laughs> that little thing shoots fire and death? <laughs> Flying metal birds? And I suppose you eat lead and blow golden bubbles, too. Kong did not respond well to cynicism, especially from a little reptilian creature. In one fluid motion, he flicked the safety off his weapon and fired three shots, blowing apart the headrest of number one seat. The imp's face was show showered with sparks and splinters, and the sound of the shots echoed like thunder in the confined space. Minerva was furious. She began screaming long before anyone could hear her. Get out of here, Kong! Out! She kept screaming this, or words to this effect, until their ears stopped ringing. When Minerva realized that Billy Kong was ignoring her commands, she switched to Taiwanese. I told my father not to employ you. You are an impulsive and violent man. You are conducting the scientific experiment here. This demon is of no use to me if he's dead. Do you understand, you reckless man? I need to communicate with our guest, so you must leave before you obviously terrify him. Go now. I warn you, or your contract will be terminated. Kong rubbed the bridge of his nose. It was taking every shred of patience he had not to dispose of this whining infant right now take his chances with her security. But it'd be foolhardy to risk everything because he could not keep his temper for a few more hours. For now, he would have to content himself with some more insolence. Kong took a small mirror from his trouser pocket and plucked at the gelled strands of his hair. I will go now, little girl, but be careful how you speak to me. You may come to regret it. Minerva spread the fingers in her right hand into a W. Whatever, she said in English. Kong pocketed his mirror, winked at number one, and left. Number one did not feel comforted by that wink. In the demon world, you winked at your opponent in pitched battle to make clear your intention to kill him next. Number one got the distinct impression that this spiky-haired human had that same intention. Minerva sighed, took a moment to compose herself, then resumed her interview with the prisoner. <sighs> Let us start at the beginning. What's your name? Number one supposed this was a safe question to answer. I have no real name, because I never warped. I used to worry about that, but now I seem to have a lot more to worry about. Minerva realized that her questions would have to be quite specific. What do people call you? You mean human people or other demons? Demons. Oh, uh, right, they, they call me number one. Number one? That's right, it's not much of a name, but it's all I have. And I console myself with the fact that it's better than number two. I see. Well then, number one, I suppose you'd like to know what's going on here. Number's eyes eyes were wide and pleading. Yes, please? Two years ago, one of your pride materialized here. Just popped in the middle of the night on the statue of De Arcantan in the courtyard. He was lucky not to be killed, actually. De Arctangan's sword pierced one of his arms. The tip broke off inside. 
Was the sword silver? Asked number one. Yes, yes it was. We realized later that the silver anchored to him to this dimension. Otherwise, he would have been attracted to his own space and time. The demon was, of course, Abbott. Uh, my parents wanted to call the Gudden Arms, but I persuaded them to bring the poor half-dead beast inside. Papa has a small surgery here that he uses for his more paranoid patients. He treated Abbott's burns, but we missed the silver tip until a few weeks later when the wound became infected and Papa did an x-ray. Abbott was quite fascinating to observe. Initially, and for many days, he flew into psychotic rages whenever a human approached him. He tried to kill us all, but vowed that his army were coming to exterminate humankind from the face of the earth. He conducted long arguments with himself. It was more like split personality. It was as if there were two people in one body, a warrior and a scientist. The warrior would rage and thrash, then the scientist would write calculations on the wall. I knew that I was onto something important here, something revolutionary. I had discovered a new species, or rather rediscovered an old one. And if Abbott really was going to bring a demon army, then it was up to me to save lives, human and demon. But of course, I am merely a child, so no one would listen. But if I could record this and present it to the Nobel Committee in Stockholm, I could win the physics prize and establish demons as a protected species. Saving a species would give me a certain satisfaction, and no child has ever won the prize before, not even the great Artemis Fowl. Something had been puzzling, number one. Aren't you a little young to be studying other species? And you're a girl, too. That pony offer made by the magic voice box sounded pretty good. Minerva had obviously come across this attitude before. Times are changing, demon, she snapped. Children are a lot smarter than they used to be. We're writing books, mastering computers, tearing apart scientific myths. Did you know that most scientists won't even acknowledge the existence of magic? Once we add magic into the energy equation, nearly all the current laws of physics are shown to be seriously flawed. I see, said number one, not convincing anyone. I am the right age for this project, added Minerva. I am young enough to believe in magic and old enough to understand how it works. When I present you in Stockholm and we put forward our thesis on time travel and magic as elemental energy, it will be a historic moment. The world will have to take magic seriously and be ready for the invasion. But there is no invasion, protested number one. Minerva smiled as a kindergarten teacher would at a fibbing child. I know all about it. Once Abbott's warrior personality became dominant, he told us about the Battle of Talte and how the demons would return and wage a terrible war with the Mud Men, as he called us. There was a lot of blood and hacking of limbs involved. Number one nodded. That sounded like Abbott. That's what Abbott believed, but things have changed. I explained that to him. I explained that he had been fitting around time for 10,000 years and that he had come a long way since then. There are more than of us than there used to be, and we don't use crossbows anymore. You didn't? You don't? You saw Mr. Kong's gun. This is only a tiny example of the kind of weaponry we have. Even if your entire pride of demons arrive all together, armed to the teeth, it would take about 10 minutes to have you all locked up. Is that what you're going to do, lock us up? That was the plan, yes, admitted Minerva. As soon as Abbott realized that the demons could never beat us, he changed his tactics. He voluntarily examined the mechanics of the time tunnel to me, and in return I gave him books to read and old weapons to examine. After a few days of reigning, he asked to be called Abbott, after General Leon Abbott in the book. I know at once I presented Leon Abbott in Stockholm, it would be easy to get funding for an international task force. Whenever a demon popped up, we could tag him with silver and house him in an artificial demon community for study. The Central Park Zoo is my preferred location. Number one ran the word zoo through his new lexicon. Uh, aren't zoo for animals? Minerva gazed at her feet. Yes, I, I am rethinking that, especially having met you. You seem quite civilized, not like that Abbott person. He was an animal. When he arrived, we tended his wounds, nursed him back to health, and all he could do was try to eat us. So we had no choice but to restrain him. So you're not going to lock us up in a zoo anymore? Actually, I don't have a choice. Judging by my calculations, the time tunnel is unraveling at both ends and deteriorating along the shaft. Soon, any calculations will be unreliable and it will be impossible to predict where or when demons will materialize. I'm afraid, number one, that your pride doesn't have long left before it disappears altogether. Number one was stunned. This was more information than anyone could absorb in one day. For some reason, the demoness with the red markings flashed in his mind. Isn't there any way to help? We are intelligent beings, you know, not animals. Minerva stood and paced, stretching one of her corkscrew curls. I have been giving that some thought. There's nothing that's to be done without magic, and Abbott told me the warlocks all died in the transition. 
It's true, number one said. He didn't mention that he might be a warlock himself. Something told him that this was valuable information and is not a good idea to reveal too much information to a person who would tie you to a chair. He had said too much already. Maybe if Abbot had known about the time spell, he wouldn't have been so eager to get back to Hybris, mused Minerva. Papa told him that there was a silver chip in his arm and that very night he dug it out with his nails and disappeared. We have the whole thing on tape. I wondered every day if he managed to make it back home. He made it, said number one. The time spell took him right back to the beginning. He never said anything about this place, just turned up with the book and the crossbow, claiming to be our savior. It was all lies. Well then, sighed Minerva, and she seemed genuinely sorry. I don't have a single idea of how to save your pride. Maybe a little friend in the next room can help when she wakes up. What little friend? Asked number one, puzzled. The one who knocked out Bobo, my brother. The little creature we captured trying to rescue you, explained Minerva. Or, more accurately, trying to rescue an empty golf bag. She looks like a magical creature. Maybe she could help. Who would want to rescue a golf bag? Wondered number one. The door cracked open, and Juan Soto's head appeared in the gap. Minerva? Not now! Snapped Minerva, waving to at the man to go away. There's a call for you. I'm not available. Take a number. The security guard persisted. He stepped into the room, one hand cupped over the mouthpiece of a cordless phone. I think you might want to talk to this person. He says his name is Optimus Fowl. Minerva gave Soda her full attention. I'll take it, she said, reaching for the phone. The LEP Recon Field Helmet was an amazing piece of equipment. The Section 8 Field Helmet, on the other hand, is a miracle of modern science. To compare the two would be akin to comparing a flintlock to a laser-sighted sniper rifle. Foley had taken full advantage of his almost unlimited budget to indulge his every tech head fantasy and stuffed the helmet with every piece of diagnostic, surveillance, defense, and just plain cool equipment he could cram in there. The centaur was vocally proud of the entire package. But if forced to pick just one add-on to brag about, he would go for the bouncing bags every time. Bouncing bags in themselves were not a recent addition. If even civilian helmets had gel bags in between their outer and inner shells to provide a little bit extra buffering in case of a crash. But Foley had replaced the helmet's rigid outer shell with a more yielding polymer, and then swapped the electrosensitive gel for tiny electrosensitive beads. The beads could be controlled with electronic pulses to expand, contract, roll, or group, providing the helmet with a simple but highly effective propulsion system. This little marvel can't fly, but it can bounce wherever you want it to, Foley had said earlier, when Holly was signing out her equipment. Only commanders get the flying helmets. I wouldn't recommend them, though. The engines field have been known to straighten perms. Not that I'm saying you have a perm, or need one for that matter. While number one was being interrogated by Minerva, Foley was flexing his fingers over the remote control for Holly's Section 8 helmet. At the moment, the helmet was locked in a wire mesh strongbox at the rear of the security office. Foley liked to sing a little ditty when he worked. In this instance, the song was the Riverbend classic. If it looks like a dwarf, smells like a dwarf, then it's probably a dwarf. Or a latrine wearing the dungarees. This was a relatively short title for a Riverbend song, which was the fairly fair equivalent of human country and western. When I got an itch I can't stretch, when there's a slug in my vol stew, when I got a sunburn in my bald patch, that's when I remember you. Foley had considerably switched off his mic, so Artemis would not have the chance to object to his singing. In fact, he was using an extremely old wire, hardwired antenna to send a signal, in the hope that no one in Police Plaza would pick up on his transmission. Haven City was in lockdown, and that meant no communications with the surface. Foley was knowingly disobeying Commander Ark Sewell's orders, and he was quite enjoying himself while doing it. The centaur donned a set of V-goggles through which he could see everything in the Velmet's vista. Not only that, but the goggles' PIP facility gave him rear and side views of the helmet's cameras. Foley already had control of the chateau security systems, now he wanted to have a little peek through their computer files, something he could not do from Section 8 HQ especially not with the LEP waiting to pounce on any signal coming out of the city. The helmet was naturally equipped with wireless omnisensor capabilities, but the closer he could get to an actual hard drive, the quicker the job could be completed. Foley pressed a combination key com command on his V keyboard. Anybody watching, it would seem that the centaur was playing an invisible piano, but in fact, the V goggles interpreted the movements as keystrokes. A small laser pencil popped out of a hidden compartment just above the right ear cushion of Holly's helmet. Foley targeted the wire mesh's box locking mechanism. 
One second burst. Fire. Nothing happened. So Foley swore briefly, turned on his microphone, and tried it again. One second burst. Fire. This time, a red beam pulsed from the pencil's tip, and the lock melted into a metallic mush. Always good to have the equipment switched on, thought Foley. Glad there was no one to witness his mistake, especially Artemis Fowl. Foley targeted a desktop computer at the far side of the office, with a glare and three blinks. Compute bounce, he ordered the helmet, and almost immediately an animated dotted arrow appeared on the screen, dipping once to the floor and then rising to the computer desk. Execute bounce, said Foley, and smiled as his creation rolled into life. The helmet hit the floor with a basketball ping, then bounced across the room, directly onto the computer desk. Perfect, you genius, said Foley, congratulating himself. Sometimes his own achievements brought a tear to his eye. I wish Columbine could see that, he thought. And then, wow, I must be getting serious about this girl. Kabaline was a centaur he had bumped into at a gallery downtown. She was a researcher with PPTV by day and a sculptor by night. A very smart lady, and she knew all about Foley. Apparently, Kabaline was a big fan of the Mood Blanket, a multi-sensor massage and homopathic garment designed by Foley specifically for centaurs. So they talked about that for a half hour. One thing led to another, and now he found himself jogging with her every evening, whenever there wasn't an emergency. Which there is now, he reminded himself, turning his attention back to work. The helmet was sitting next to the human computer keyboard, with its omnisensor pointed directly at the hard drive. Foley stared at the hard drive and blinked three times, selecting it on the screen. Download all files from this and any network and computers, instructed the centaur, and the helmet immediately began to suck information from the Apple Mac. After several seconds, an animated bottle on the V-Goggle screen was filled to the brim and burped. Transfer completed. Now they could find out exactly how much information these inf humans had and where they were getting it from. But there was still the matter of backup files. This group could have burned their information onto CDs or even sent it by email or stored it on the internet. Foley used the virtual keyboard to open a data charge folder and send a virus into the human computer. The charge would completely wipe out any computers on the network. Before that, it would run along any internet pathways explored by these humans and completely burn the sites. Foley would have liked to see a bit more delicate about it, but just erase very related files. But he couldn't afford to take chances with this mysterious group. The mere fact that they had avoided detection for so long was proof that they were not to be trifled with. This was a major virus to lob into a human system. It would probably crash thousands of sites, including Google and Yahoo, but Foley didn't see that he had a choice. On Foley's screen, the data charge appeared as a red flickering flame that chuckled nastily as it dived into the Omnisensor's data stream. In five minutes, the Paradiso's hard drives would be burned beyond repair, and as an added bonus, the charge would also attach itself to any storage devices within the sensor's range that bore the network signature. So any information stored on CDs, or flash drives, would disintegrate as soon as someone tried to load them. It was potent stuff, and there wasn't a firewall or antivirus that could stop it. Artemis' voice issued from two gel speakers and jars on the desk, interrupting his concentration. There's a wall safe in the office. It's where Minerva keeps her notes. You should need to burn anything inside it. Wall safe. Let's see. The centaur ran an x-ray scan on the room and found the safe behind a row of shelving. Given the time, he would have liked to have scanned all the contents, but he had a rendezvous to keep. He sent a concentrated laser beam the width, of, the width of the length of fishing line into the belly of the safe, reducing the contents to ash. Hopefully he was destroying more than the family jewels. The x-ray scan revealed nothing else promising, so Foley sent the head bead spinning, toppling Holly's helmet off the desk. In a display of keyboard virtuosity, Foley used the laser to carve a section from the base of the office door while the helmet was in mid-air. In two choreographed bounces, the helmet was through the section and into the corridor outside. Foley grinned, satisfied. Never even touch the wood, he said. The centaur called up a blueprint for the Chateau Paradiso and superimposed it on a grid on his screen. There were two dots on the grid. One was the helmet, and the other was Holly. It was time the two were reunited. As he worked, Foley unconsciously sang a verse of the Riverbend Dirge. My lucky number ran out of luck. When I'm stuck in the hole, I tumbled too. When my favorite dog got squished by a truck, that's when I think me some thoughts of you. On the planet's surface, Artemis winced as the song twanged through his tiny phone and along his thumb. Please, Foley, he said in pain tones. I'm trying to negotiate the only other line. Foley whinnied surprised. He had forgotten about Artemis. 
Some people ain't got no riverbend in their souls, he said, switching off his microphone. Billy Kong decided that he'd have a little word with the new prisoner. The female, if it was indeed female. How was he supposed to know for sure what class of creature it was? It looked like a girl, but maybe demon girls weren't the same as human ones. So Billy Kong thought he might ask it what it exactly it was, among other things. If the creature decided not to answer, Kong didn't mind. There were ways to persuade people to talk. Asking them nicely was one way, giving them candy was another. But Billy Kong preferred torture. Back in the early 80s, when Billy Kong was still plain old Jonah Lee, he had lived in the California beach town of Malibu with his mother Annie and big brother Eric. Annie worked two jobs to keep her boys in sneakers, so Jonah got left with Eric in the evenings. That should have worked out fine. Eric was 16 and old enough to look after his kid brother. But like most 16 year olds, he had more on his mind than little brothers. In fact, babysitting Jonah was seriously interfering with his social life. The problem was, as Eric saw it, that Jonah was an outdoorsy kind of boy. As soon as Eric took off to hang out with his friends, Jonah would ignore his big brother's orders and head out into the California evening. And outdoors in the city was no place for an eight-year-old. So what Eric needed to do was devise a scheme that kept Jonah indoors and allowed Eric to roam free. He came upon the perfect strategy quite by accident one night, returning home after a late night argument with his girlfriend's other boyfriend and his brothers. For once, Jonah had not ventured out and was plonked in front of the TV, watching a horror show on hacked cable. Eric, who has always been impulsive and reckless, had taken to sneaking around with the girlfriend of a local gangster. Now word had leaked out and the gang was after him. They'd roughed him up a bit already, but he'd gotten away. He was bloody and tired, but still kind of enjoying himself. Lock the doors, he called to his little brother, staring at him out of his stup TV stupor. Jonah jumped to his feet, eyes widening as he noticed Eric's bloody nose and lip. What happened to you? Eric grinned. He was that kind of person. Exhausted, battered, but buzzing with adrenaline. I got... There was this bunch of... And then he stopped, because the spark of an idea was ricocheting around in his head. He must look pretty beat up. Maybe he could use this to keep little Jonah indoors while mom was working. I can't tell ya, he said, dragging a smear of blood across his face with one sleeve. I've sworn an oath, just bolt the doors and close the shutters. Usually, Jonah didn't have time for his brother's theatrics, but tonight there was blood and horror on the TV, and he could hear footsteps pounding up the driveway. Damn it, they found me, swore Eric, peeking through a shutter. Little Jonah grabbed his brother's sleeve. Who's found you, Eric? You gotta tell me. Eric appeared to consider it. <sighs> okay, he said finally. I belong to a uh, <clears throat> secret society. We fight a secret enemy. What, like a gang? No. We fight demons. Demons? Said little Jonah, half skeptical, half scared out of his wits. Yeah, yeah, they're all over California. By day, they're normal guys, accountants, basketball players, stuff like that. But at night, they peel off their skin and go hunting kids. Under tens. Uh, under tens? Like me? Like you, exactly like you. I found these demons chewing on a couple of twin girls, maybe eight years old. I killed most of them, but a few were followed me home. We gotta stay real quiet or they'll go away. Jonah rushed for the phone. We should call mom. No, said Eric, snatching the phone. We want to get mom killed. Is that what you want? The idea of his mother dying started Jonah crying. No, no, mom, mom can't die. Exactly, Eric said gently. You've got to leave the demon slain to me and my boys. When you're 15, then you'd be sworn in. But until then, this is our secret. You stay in the house and let me do my duty. Promise? Jonah nodded, blubbering too much to say the word. And so the brothers sat huddled on the sofa while Eric's girlfriend's boyfriend's brothers battered on the windows and called him out. This was a cruel trick, Eric thought. Maybe I'll just let her run for a couple of months and keep the kid out of trouble until everything dies down. The deception worked well. Jonah didn't set foot outside the house after dusk for weeks. He sat on the couch with his knees drawn to his chin, waiting for Eric to return with elaborate demon slaying stories. Every night he feared that his brother would not return, that the demons would kill him. One night, his fears came to pass. The cops said that Eric had been killed by a notorious gang of brothers who had been gunning for him. Something about a girl. But Jonah knew different. He knew the demons had done it. They'd peeled off their faces and killed his brother. So Jonah Lee, now known as Billy Kong, was going in to see Holly, carrying the weight of his childhood memories. For the sake of his sanity, he had managed to convince himself over the decades that there were no demons, that his beloved brother had lied to him. 
This betrayal had messed him for, up for years, preventing him from forming lasting relationships and making it a lot easier for him to hurt people. And now this crazy Minerva girl was paying him to help her hunt down actual demons. And it turns out they were real. He had seen them with his own eyes. At this stage, Billy Kong couldn't tell fact from fiction. Part of him believed that well, he had a bad accident and that all this was a coma hallucination. All Billy knew for sure was that if there was the slightest chance that these demons were the same ones who had killed Eric, then they were going to pay. It was revenge he was after. Holly was not too happy playing the victim. She had enough of that in the academy. Every time the curriculum was thrown up a role-playing game, Holly, as the only girl in that class, had been picked to be the hostage, or the elf walking home alone, or the teller facing a bank robber. She tried to object that this was stereotyping, but the instructor had replied that stereotypes were stereotypes for a reason, and get that blonde wig on. So when Hall Artemis proposed that she allow herself to get caught, Holly had taken a bit of persuading. Now she was tied to a wooden chair in a dark, damp basement room, waiting for some human to come and torture her. The next time Artemis had planned involving someone to be taken hostage, he could play that part himself. It was ridiculous. She was a captain in her 80s, and Artemis is a 14-year-old civilian. And yet he was dishing out the orders and she was taking them. That's because Artemis is a tactical genius, said her sensible shy. Oh, shut up, her irritated side responded eloquently. And then Billy Kong came into the room and proceeded to irritate Holly even further. He glided across the floor like a pale, hair-gelled ghost, circling Holly silently several times before speaking. Tell me something, demon. Can you peel off your face? Holly met his eyes. With what, my teeth? Hands tied, moron! Billy Kong sighed. Lately, everyone under five feet seemed to think it was the prerogative to give him verbal abuse. You probably know I'm not supposed to kill you, said Billy, teasing his hair into spikes. But I often do things that I'm not supposed to. Holly decided to crack this human's confidence a little. I know that, Billy. Or should I say Jonah? You've done a lot of bad things over the years. Kong took a step back. Y you know me? We all know about you, Billy. We've been watching you for years. This wasn't strictly true, of course. Holly knew no more about Kong than what Foley had told her. Perhaps she wouldn't have baited him if she had, she had known about his demon history. To Billy Kong, this simple statement was confirmation of everything Eric had told him. Suddenly, the building blocks of his beliefs and understandings toppled and smashed beyond repair. It was all true. Eric hadn't lied. Demons walked the earth, and his brother had tried to protect him and paid with his life. You remember my brother? He asked, his voice shaking. Holly presumed that this was a test. Foley had mentioned a brother. Yeah, I remember. Derek, wasn't it? Kong pulled a stiletto knife from his breast pocket, gripping it so tightly his knuckles whitened. Eric! He shouted, spittle spraying from his mouth. It was Eric! Do you remember what happened to him? Holly suddenly felt nervous. This mud man was unstable. It would only ever take her a second to escape from these bonds, but maybe a second was too long. Artemis had requested that she remain bound for as long as possible, but from the look on Billy Kong's face, it seemed that staying bound could be a fatal mistake. Do you remember what happened to my brother? Asked Kong again, waving the knife like a conductor's baton. I remember. He died. Violently, said Holly. Kong was thunderstruck, reeling internally. For several moments, he circled the room muttering to himself, which didn't comfort Holly any. It's true! My Eric never betrayed me! My brother loved me! He loved me and they took him! Holly took advantage of his lack of focus to escape from the plastic ties binding her wrists. She did this using an old LEP trick taught to her by Commander Vignea back in the academy. She rubbed her wrists against the rough edge, causing two small gat grazes. When magical sparks erupted from her fingertips to heal the wounds, she siphoned off a few to melt the plastic, just enough for her to yank her way out. When Kong faced Holly again, she was untethered but concealing the fact. Kong knelt before her so their eyes were level. He was blinking rapidly and his pulse beat in a temple vein. He spoke slowly in a voice fraught with barely repressed madness and violence. He had switched to Taiwanese, his family's first language. I don't want to rip off your face right now. This, reasoned Kong, would be his final proof. If this demon could peel off her face, then he would stab her in the heart and damn the consequences. I can't, said Holly. My hands are tied. Why don't you peel it off for me? We have new masks now, disposable. They come off easily. Kong coughed in surprise, rocking back on his hunkers. Then he steadied himself and reached out with shaking hands. 
His hands did not shake from fear, but from anger and sorrow that he had dishonored his brother's memory by believing the worst of him. At the hairline, said Holly. Just grab and pull. Don't worry if you tear it. Kong looked up and they made eye contact. This was all Holly needed to employ the magical fairy Mesmer. Don't those arms feel heavy? She asked, her voice layered and irresistible. Kong's brow suddenly creased, and the crease is filled with sweat. My arms, what? They're like lead, like two lead pipes. I can't... Holly pushed the Mesmer a little harder. Why don't you put them down? Take it easy. Sit on the floor. Kong sat on the concrete. I'm just going to sit for a second. The, you're still doing the face peeling thing, but in a second, <laughs> I'm tired. You probably feel like talking. You know what, demon? I feel like talking. What should we talk about? This whole group you're involved with, Billy. The Paradisos. Tell me about them. Kong snorted. The Paradisos. You're only dealing with one Paradiso here, and that's the girl Minerva. Her daddy is just a money man. If Minerva wants it, Gaspard pays for it. He's so proud of his little girl, the genius that he does whatever he, she says. Can you believe that she convinced him to keep the whole demon thing quiet until after the Nobel Council gets a look at her research? This was very good news. You mean, there's no one outside this house knows about the demons? Hardly anybody inside the house knows. Minerva is paranoid that some other AK will get a hold of her work. The staff thinks we're guarding a political prisoner who keeps his face really done. Only Juan Soda, the chief of in-house security, and myself know the truth. Does Minerva keep records? Records? She had set everything down. And I mean everything. We have records of every demon action right down to toilet breaks. She got every twitch on video. The only reason there's no cameras down here is that we weren't expecting anyone. Where does she keep those notes? A little wall safe in the security office. Minerva thinks I don't know the combination, but I do. Bobo's birthday. Holly touched a skin-colored microphone pad glued to her throat. A wall safe in the security office. She said clearly, I hope you're getting that. There was no reply. Wearing an earpiece had been too risky, so Holly had to make do with the mic pad on her neck, and an iris cam suckered like a contact lens over her right eye. Kong still felt like talking. You know, I'm gonna kill all you demons. I've got a plan real clever too. Miss Minerva thinks we're going to Stockholm, but that's never gonna happen. I'm just waiting for the right moment. I know that silver is the only thing keeping you in this dimension. So I'm just going to send you back and give you a little present to take with you. Not if I can help it, thought Holly. Kong smiled at her. Are we doing the face peeling thing? Can you really do that? Of course I can. Are you sure you want to see it? Kong nodded, slack-jawed. Okay then, watch carefully. Holly raised her hands to her face. When she took them away, her head had disappeared. Her body and limbs quickly followed suit. Not only can I peel my face, said Holly's voice from thin air, I can do my entire body. It's true. It's all true. Then a tiny invisible fist swished through the air, knocking him into unconsciousness. Billy Kong lay on the concrete floor, dreaming that he was Jonah Lee once more, and his brother stood before him saying, I told you so, bro. I told you they were demons. They murdered me back in Malibu. So what are you going to do about it? And little Jonah answered, I'm working on it, Eric. Minerva accepted the phone from the security guard. Minerva Paradiso speaking. Minerva, this is Artemis Fowl, said a voice in perfect French. We met once across a crowded room in Sicily. I know who you are. We nearly met in Barcelona, too. And I know it's really you. I memorize your voice pattern and cadence from a lecture you gave on Balkan politics two years ago at Trinity College. Very good. I find it strange I haven't heard of you. Minerva smiled. I am not as careless as you, Artemis. I prefer anonymity until I have something exceptional to be recognized for. The existence of demons, for instance, prompted Artemis. That would be exceptional. Minerva gripped the phone tightly. Yes, Master Fowl, it would be exceptional. It is exceptional. The last thing I need is some forbig-headed teenage boy to hijack all my work at the last second. You had your own demon, but that wasn't enough. You had to try and steal mine, too. The moment I recognized you in Barcelona, I knew you would be after my research subject. I knew you would try to smoke us out. I have someone hide in the car. It was a larger thing to do, so I booby-trapped the vehicle. You knocked out my baby brother, too. How could you? 
Apparently, I did you a favor, said Artemis lightly. Little Bobo is obnoxious by all accounts. Is that why you called me? To insult my family? No, replied Artemis. I do apologize, that was juvenile. I call you to try and make you see sense. There is much more at stake here than a Nobel Prize. Not to belittle the prize, of course. Minerva smiled knowingly. Artemis Fowl, whatever your pretense, you called me because your plan failed. I have your demon and you want her back. But if it makes you feel any better, please proceed with your good of humanity speech. Outside, on the bluff overlooking Chateau Paradiso, Artemis frowned. This girl reminded him a lot of himself 18 months ago, when achievement and acquisition were everything, and family and friends were secondary. Honesty, on this occasion, actually was the best policy. Miss Paradiso, he said gently. Minerva, listen to me for a few moments. You'll feel the truth of what I have to say. Minerva tutted. Why is that? Because we're connected. Actually, we are. We are similar people. Both the most intelligent person in whatever room we happen to be in. Both consistently underestimated. Both determined to shine brightest in whichever discipline we pursue. Both dogged by scorn and loneliness. Ridiculous, scoffed Minerva, but her prostations rang hollow. I am not lonely. I have my work. Artemis persisted. I know how it feels, Minerva. And let me tell you, no matter how many prizes you win, no matter how many theorems you prove, it will not be enough to make people like you. Oh, spare me your amateur psychology lecture. You're not even three years older than I am. Artemis was injured. Ugh, hardly amateur. And for your information, age is often detrimental to intelligence. I have written a paper on the subject in psychology today, under the pseudonym Dr. C. Nile Dementia. Minerva giggled. <laughs> I get it, C. Nile Dementia. Very good. Artemis himself smiled. You are the first person to get that. I always am. Me too. Don't you find that tiresome? Incredibly. I mean, what is wrong with people? Everybody says I have no sense of humor, then I construct a perfectly sound pun around a well-known psychological condition and is ignored. People should be rolling in the aisles. Absolutely, agreed Minerva. That happens to me all the time. I know. I love that Murray Gell man kidnapping a quirk joke that you did on the train. Very clever analogy. The congenial conversation ground to a frosty halt. How did you hear that? How long have you been spying on me? Artemis was quietly stunned. He had not meant to reveal that fact. It was most unlike him to chatter on about trifles when there were lives at stake. But he liked this Minerva girl. She was so similar to him. There was a security camera in the compartment on the train. I procured the tape, had it enhanced, and read your lips. Hmm, said Minerva. I don't remember the camera. It was there, inside a red plastic bubble, fisheye lens. I apologize for the intrusion of your privacy, but it was an emergency. Minerva was silent for a moment. Artemis, we could have a lot to talk about. I haven't talked this much with a boy in, well, ever, but I have to finish this project. Can you call me again in six weeks? Six weeks will be too late. The world will be a different place and possibly not a better one. Artemis, stop it. I was just beginning to like you, and now we're back to where we started. Just give me one more minute, Artemis insisted. If I can't convince you within a single minute, then I will hang up and leave you to your research. 59, 58. Artemis wondered if all girls were so emotional. Holly could be this way too. Warm one moment and icy the next. You were holding two creatures captive, both sentient, neither human. If you expose either one to the wider scientific community, then their kind will be hunted down. You will be responsible for the extinction of at least one species. Is that what you want? That's what they want, retorted Minerva. The first one we rescued threatened to kill us all and possibly eat us. He said that the demons would return and wipe out the human scourge. I know all about Abbott, said Artemis, using what he had learned from Minerva's own surveillance cameras. He was a dinosaur. Demons could never take on humans now. Judging by my temporal calculations, Abbott was whisked 10,000 years into his own future, then sent back again. Declaring war on demons would be like declaring war on monkeys. In fact, monkeys would be a bigger threat. There are more of them. And anyway, de the demons can't even fully materialize unless we shoot them full of silver. I am sure you'll find a way around that. Or one could get through it accidentally, just like Abbott, then open the gates for the rest of them. Highly unlikely. I mean, really, Minerva, what are the odds? So... Artemis Fowler wants me to forget all about my Nobel Prize and turn my demon captives loose. Forget the pro project, certainly, said Artemis, checking his watch. But I don't think there is any need for you to set your captives free. Oh, 
really? And why is that? Because, I imagine, they are already gone. Minerva spun around to face the spot where number one had been sitting. It was empty. Her captive demon had disappeared along with this chair. A perfunctory sweep told her the entire room was empty, except for her. What is Yatamis? She screamed into the phone. What is my prize? Forget about all this, said Artemis softly. It's not worth it. Take it from someone who has made your mistakes. I will call you soon. Minerva squeezed the phone as though it were Artemis's neck. You tricked me, she said, the truth suddenly dawning on her. You allowed me to capture your demon. But Artemis did not reply. He had reluctantly closed his fist on the conversation. Generally, outsmarting someone gave him a warm and fuzzy feeling, but hoodwinking Minerva Paradiso just made him feel like a sneak. It was ironic that he felt like a bad guy now that he was almost a good guy. Butler glanced across him from his perch on the knoll. How'd that go? He asked. Your first lengthy conversation with a girl your own age. Fabulous, said Artemis, his voice dripping with sarcasm. We're planning a June wedding.